So we've been focusing on hope this week in the mornings. I want to continue that. There's a word found in Psalms, Psalm 42. This begins what is known as book two in the breaking down of Psalms. Psalm 42, verse one says, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night while people say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God. For I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. From this text, I want to speak to you on the title, Hoping for the Best and Not Settling for Less. Hoping for the Best, Not Settling for Less. God, I pray that this would be your message, that ultimately you would be speaking. I would just be the vessel that you uh, have chosen to use in these few moments to speak to these, your children, my sisters and brothers. God, I desire to be obedient to your word. So please let it be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Hoping for the best, not settling for less. What do you do when you're desperate? When you find yourself in some sort of, some kind of desperate situation, what do you do? Uh, There are days when I don't plan my lunch well. And so I have too many meetings. I didn't pack a lunch ahead of time. I should have. I could have made my lunch the night before. I could have made my lunch early that morning. But now I'm into my work rhythm, and I realize maybe I've got like 30 minutes now between the last meeting and the next meeting, and it's somewhere around the lunch hour. So now in desperation, I jump in my car, and I'm trying to figure out where I'm going to eat and where I can do this, and I can get something and get back to the office in time for the next meeting. It's desperate times, and now I've gone beyond hungry to hangry, and so it's desperate times, and then I find myself out of desperation in the drive-thru at Carl Jr.'s getting some fried zucchini sticks. This is what happens (laughs) when you are desperate, when you procrastinate, when the world causes desperation to arrive at your doorstep, when by your own behavior you find yourself desperate. I remember before Danisha and I started dating in high school, it was my junior year in high school, and it was getting closer and closer to prom. And I wanted to go to prom. My, my friends were going. They, they were all asking, you know, the guys were asking, uh, you know, females to the prom, and they were hooking up, coupling up. They were all had their plans going on for prom, and it was getting closer and closer to prom. And I, there was somebody I wanted to ask, but I was a little nervous to ask her. So, I, you know, I was procrastinating. And now, you know, everybody, all, everybody in my friend circle is now going to prom. They're making plans, not me. And it's getting close. It's like, like it, it's literally three weeks away from prom. And so the, this girl, Dion, that, that I was going to ask, but I was a little nervous to ask, she, she said to me in, in fifth hour class, she said, hey, are, are, are you going to prom? I said, I, I think so. She said, who you going with? I said, I don't know yet. She said, oh, you don't have anybody to go to prom with yet? I said, no. She said, oh, we should talk on the phone later. And so we exchanged numbers. I was like, ha, ha, ha. And so she calls me that, that night. We were talking on the phone, me and Dion. And she's like, so you don't, you don't have anybody to go to prom with yet? I was like, no, do you have anybody you're going to prom with? She was like, you don't have nobody you're going to prom with? And I was like, no, 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 I don't. She said, oh, good. And she put her friend Stacy on the phone. <laughs> and then Stacy said like this. You going to prom with anybody? I said, no. Oh, you want to go to prom? I was like, okay. And then Dion got back on the phone. She said, this is awesome, because me and Derek are already going to prom, and now the four of us can go to prom together. See what happens when you're in desperate times. Me and Stacy are at prom. I mean, we don't even dance. People are dancing, having fun. We're just sitting there. We took pictures like this. And then my mom put it on the mantle at home. 
to remind me of what happens when you procrastinate, when you get in desperate times, when you wait too late. I went to my grandparents' house in Louisiana and the picture was on their mantle too. <laughs> Praise God I met Donisha the next year and we went to prom. I don't know what's going on in Stacy's life. I really don't know today, but that was the worst prom ever, me and Stacy. That was the worst prom. <laughs> what do you do when life takes you to a place of desperation? What do you do when your own behavior takes you to a place of desperation? Some people do unhealthy things when they feel desperate when they feel desperate financially, when they feel desperate relationally, when they feel like they're at this low place in life, when they're at a place of brokenness. And they, it, 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 for some people, this is the moment where, where they go to places they should not go. They say things they should not say. They get involved in relationships they shouldn't get involved in. When they find themselves desperate, and yet... God desires for desperation to be the divine moment where we find hope, where we find hope in God. Because desperation can become crisis. And then it raises the question, what do we do in crisis? And God desires that in desperation, in crisis, that we would find hope in God. Because crisis doesn't mean God has forgotten about you. It could mean God is looking for you. In desperation, in crisis, it could mean God is not away from you. God is waiting on you. Find hope in the God who is pursuing you, even in desperate times, even in crisis, even in challenge, even in times of stress and anxiety, even when you're losing sleep. Find hope in God. Where will you allow God to take you when you're desperate? Where will you allow God to take you when you're in crisis? Where will you allow God to take you when you don't have the answers in your own power? When you can't come up with the solution, even though you're college educated, even though you've lived a long time, even though you've had a lot of experiences, even though you've got some wisdom and you've got some, some strength in your own ability, there are desperate times where you need a divine savior. Psalms. Psalms is full of words from desperate people in need of finding hope in God. It has been said that the Psalms cover every possible circumstance that life could ever throw at us. If you want to know how to deal with problems, if you want to know how to deal with anxieties, if you want to know how to deal with stresses, if you want to know how to keep your hope in spite of what's going on around you, check out Psalms. It's like every crisis, every problem, every thing you could go through, there's a poem, there's a song, there's a crying out from the Psalms. King David is the author of much of Psalms, but not all of it. Matter of fact, uh, Psalm 42 is one of those Psalms not written by David. But the Psalms remind us that, that we can keep it real with God. Like, like, like when you read the Psalms, these, these are, they're, they're, some of these words are like anger to God. Questioning God, frustration with God, begging God. But like what it is, is it, it's, it's authentic language to God. Like this is not over-spiritualizing. This is not, oh God, thank you. I feel so blessed and highly favored. Thank you, oh divine one. I'm so full of the Holy Spirit. I'm so glad this supernatural righteousness is flowing through my being in temple. Oh Lord, thank you, Lord, have mercy. Thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. Now, these people are like, why God? Why is this happening to me? Why divorce? I never planned this. Why this situation? I never planned this. I never expected this. Why the abuse? Why the disappointment? Why the frustration? 
How long must I deal with this situation? I have prayed about this year after year after year after year. Why, God? God, I'm sorry. I know I, 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 know I messed up, but that was 25 years ago, and I feel like I'm still paying the price for something I did 25 years ago. That's the Psalms. It, it comes across like that. Real people in desperate situations, keeping it real with God, trying to find hope again. And, and as a reminder, what is the kind of hope that we're talking about? We're talking about a confident expectation and desire for what is to come, a belief that something good will come from God regardless of our current circumstances. This is a hope in God. This is a hope that is about believing that God ultimately provides this hope, not me. Hope is supernatural. I need a hope that doesn't come naturally to me. I I need a hope. I I need something beyond what I see right now in front of me. Hope is about what God is doing. It's about what God has done. It's about by faith what I believe God will do, even though God ultimately decides how it's going to play out. But I trust God anyway. Hope in God. I, I wonder if people that quit believing in God if they really had an authentic, real, intimate relationship with God in the first place. I mean, I don't know. There there might be some real broken circumstances in which people just, they throw in the towel because the the pain is too much for them. I don't know, but but I'm hoping, (laughs) pun intended, that we will not lose our hope in God no matter what. So what is the key to finding the hope you need? What, What is the key? to finding the hope you need. Well, this Psalm 42, it's written by the sons of Korah, it says. The sons of Korah, they are worship leaders. They they are active in what is called in the Bible Levitical worship. So they're at the temple. They're, They're worshiping God, which is interesting that they would write a psalm like this where they're crying out in desperation because they're already in church. They know God. They're on the church staff. They're in church leadership. They're the worshipers. They're they're the Levitical priests. I mean, what is going on? Why are the sons of Korah, uh, why are they crying out? Why are they the ones desperate? What this shows us is you can be a Christian and find yourself in desperate situations. Like, we don't have to put on a mask. We We don't have to play theater with God. We don't have to play theater with each other. You, you, you know, I mean, I mean hypocrite. Uh, I, I'm not calling you. I'm talking about these other Christians, not y'all. I'm, I'm, but, but I'm saying hypocrite sounds like a nasty word, don't it? I mean, like, if somebody calls you a hypocrite, you're like, what? Who are you, who are you talking to? You know what I mean? Like, hypocrite, that, that, that's, that's a harsh word, right? But, but that word, the root word for hypocrite, really just comes from uh, the Greek and, and for theater, for the arts, where there's a mask. One has a smiley face. One has a sad face. And it's just all hypocrite really means is to wear a mask. And I'm not talking about y'all, but if I'm honest about me, there have been seasons in my Christian life where I've worn a mask, where where I I felt like, you know, I I get get up and preach before people. I I I got to convince people I really believe this. I got to convince people this is real stuff, even though I'm, I'm dealing with insecurity and I'm dealing with some shame issues. I'm dealing with confidence issues or I'm, I'm questioning myself. I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with my own issues, yet I'm trying to stand before people and, and, and put it this way. I even have a theater background. I mean, I went to a performing arts high school. I was a theater major in college. I mean, I've done a, a film. So I, like, it, it would be easy for me to just make the preaching the performance and, and to wear a mask in front of people. But you don't have to be a pastor. You don't, you don't have to be a preacher. I mean, you, 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 you could be an everyday Christian with, with no ministerial credential and wear a mask. And, 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 and so the sons of Korah, they're, they're worship leaders. They're in the temple. They believe in God. But yet they're willing to take the risk of crying out in these words, in this song crying out for hope, wanting their hope in God restored. So what is the key to finding the hope that you need? One, 
When you're desperate, discover or rediscover God. When you're desperate, discover or rediscover God. Psalm 42, verse 1, it says, As the deer pants for streams of water, my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet God? My tears have been my food day and night. What these God believers are saying is that sometimes I find myself in such a situation that I can't even eat. And, and my, my tears become my food. My sadness, my sorrow becomes my nutrients because I can't even get myself to the table to eat. My tears have been my food day and night while people say to me all day long, where is your God? You know, this is, it's messed up when you're already struggling as a Christian. You're already going through something. And then the people around you, they're not very helpful. They're like, I thought you were a Christian. I thought you said you believed in God. I thought you said God was a healer. I thought you you, why, man, why are you looking like that? Why you look so sad? Why you got attitude? I thought you were a Christian. I thought you believed in the Bible. Like, that's not helpful right now. Shut up. <laughs> so so, so the, the, these, these godly people, you know, that be, they believe in God, but yet they find themselves in a desperate situation. They're crying out. And, and maybe, maybe this is just, they're just being songwriters right here. But you know what? The best songs are written by the artists that actually went through what they're singing about. And this song sounds too good. This poem sounds too good. Now, I think they know about what they're singing about right here. <laughs> Man, people are saying to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. They're saying, I remember a time before I was going through what I'm going through now, before I had the challenges I have now in life. But before, I mean, we can just keep it real because you dismissed them. Before I had these kids, I used to, oh, I used to be, I used to be the happiest Christian ever. Before, you know, I, I used to, oh, I used to, I used to I'd be, be like this at the, at the church. Now I'm like, sit down, sit down, sit down. <laughs> not y'all. I'm not talking about y'all. I'm talking about these other Christians. Uh, and they're like, there was a time in my life where it just seemed like, man, the Christian life, life with God was just like, oh, my gosh, it was just awesome, wonderful. What's wrong now? Man, I love this song because it's just keeping it real. He said, they say, verse five, why, my soul, are you downcast? If you read the entirety of this text, downcast is mentioned three times. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? But here's the turn. Out of the desperation, out of the desperation, here's the turn. Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. It is okay to have sorrow. It is okay to have grief. It is okay to be angry for a little while. It is okay to be disturbed. It is okay to be frustrated. But, but find your hope again. Discover God again. Rediscover God. Maybe in your marriage. Maybe in parenting. Maybe in your career. Maybe in your manhood. Maybe in your womanhood. There's a place. There's one place where right now it's time to discover God for the first time. It is time, papaya time, to discover that God loves you. That God loves you so much. Or it's time to rediscover God's grace. Maybe this is the moment to rediscover God's truth for you, to rediscover God's grace for you, to rediscover God's forgiveness for you, to rediscover God's wisdom for you, to rediscover God's purpose for you. Uh, I, 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 my, my, one of my chief aims for this week, I believe it is for Pastor Aaron as well, is that through these messages, you would rediscover with greater clarity God's purpose for your life, God's purpose for you. 
as a man, as a woman, as a husband, as a wife, as a father, as a mother, single, uh, as a single parent, wherever you might be, as grandparents, as retired, as in transition, as stepping into a new career, and moving to a new state, moving into a new service, wherever you are, this would be an opportunity with hope to get greater clarity on your purpose, greater clarity on why God has you. So when you're desperate, Discover, rediscover God. Some people, when they get desperate, they do not rediscover God. Some people, when they're desperate, they rediscover drug abuse. Some people, when they're desperate, they rediscover uh, being an alcoholic. Some people, they rediscover anger. They rediscover pride. They rediscover stubbornness. They rediscover unforgiveness. They rediscover division. They rediscover low self-esteem. They rediscover depression. Some people, when they're desperate, they rediscover discover natural things. What you're going through, what you're dealing with, you need a discovery of something supernatural, something beyond your own power, beyond your own strength. When you're desperate, rediscover God. Amen. And you'll find something great. A pastor friend of mine said, anyone who God has helped greatly has probably hurt deeply on some level. If you think about the moments where God did something great in your life, if you really look back and investigate, you'll remember that there have been moments when God did something great in your life at a moment where you were deeply hurting to remind you that when you hurt again, God will show up again. God is Azer in the Hebrew, a present help, which, which means every time there is a present right now moment where you are hurting, God once again can be a present help. When you're desperate, rediscover God. I got to get out of point one. Point two, <laughs> when you're down, remember the one who lifts you up. When you're down, remember the one who lifts you up. Psalm 42, verses 6 through 8. My soul is downcast within me. There's that, there's that say it got downcast. Now they just said, put your hope in God. Now they're back at it again. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mazar. This, this is saying when I get downcast, sometimes I have to remember what God did to me in the past, what God did to my people in the past. I'm hurting right now, but this, I'm downcast. But man, God brought my people into the promised land. I'm downcast, but I heard that my people were in slavery in Egypt and God opened up the waters and they walked through the divided waters into a liberated existence. I, I, I'm going to remember. I'm downcast, but I'm going to remember. I'm gonna, I've, I've been here before. I've seen this movie before. You know, it didn't go exactly like this the last time, but it was something like this. What am I going to do? When you're down, remember the one who lifts you up. Seven, verse 7 says, deep calls to deep. In the roar of your waterfalls, all your waves and breakers have swept over me. It, it is a, sometimes when you feel like you're drowning in the natural, when you feel like you're suffocating because of what you're going through, let the waters of God refresh you. Let, let hope in God do something deep in your soul. Verse 8, by day the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. When you're down, remember the one who lifts you up. We're going to get down. That's part of living in a broken world. That's just the deal. I can't promise you a life. Even following Jesus, there is no promise of a life with no pain, no suffering, no frustration, no anxiety. The mark of the Christian is to sustain hope in the midst of that. Be real about your feelings. Don't deny them. Be real about your emotions. Be real about what's going on in your head. You need people in your life that you love and trust enough. You need an inner circle that you can be around where you can keep it real. 
and go, you know I'm a Christian, but man, I feel like cussing. I mean, like, you need somebody like that. You, you need somebody to go, I, you know I'm a Christian, but man, right now, I'm, I'm, man, I'm so, yeah, yeah, pray for me. Yeah, we better pray now. You need people around you in your life you can keep it real with. Man, Psalms is so, it's so real. I'm so glad this isn't just a rated G Disney adventure series right here. When you're down, remember who lifts you up. I don't know where you are right now. You might be here right now having a mountaintop experience. Well, what I'm saying is just preparing you for the valley that might be ahead. So if you're on the mountaintop, praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. But for those of us in the valley, for those of us in the pit, for those of us in the well, I want you to know it ain't over. There is hope in God. He will lift you up. God will pull you up. Daniel ended up in a lion's den. God lifted him up. Moses was depressed in a different blue-collar job than his calling because he had murdered somebody. He grew up without his biological parents. He had child origin issues. He was not emotionally healthy, but a burning bush lifted him up to his calling as a liberator of people. Esther, after winning a beauty pageant, is concerned that a law has been passed that will murder all her people, but she asked through her cousin Mordecai, fast and pray for me that God would lift up her courage. I don't know what valley you're in. I don't know what you're going through, but I know there's no place too low. Maybe Marvin Gaye was right when he said, ain't no valley low enough. Ain't no mountain high enough to keep God. I just rearranged the song to keep God from getting to you, babe. God will lift you up. God will pick you up. When you're down, remember the one who lifts you up. And three, when you feel alone, receive God's presence. When you feel alone, receive God's presence. Psalm 42, verse 9 through 11. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me. What, have you ever felt your sorrow in your bones? There, there's, there's a book, my, my wife, Denise, she, she uh, hit me to this book called uh, The Body Keeps Score. And it's like sometimes the pain you feel in your neck, the pain you feel in your back, the pain. Some of it might be, you know, just because, man, I, I, I ran a long way and I'm just feeling it, I'm getting older. But sometimes your body is telling you what you won't listen to from your soul. You didn't listen to your heart. You didn't listen to your soul. You didn't listen to the emotions, so your body had to tell it. Your body, you, you had to get a pain in your knee. You had to get pain in your hip. You had to get pain in your back. You had to get pain in your neck. So the, because finally, you didn't listen to your heart. You didn't listen to your mind. You didn't. So finally, the body said, hey, because the body keeps score. Sometimes the trauma on the inside becomes pain in the bones, in the muscles, in the joints. So he said, he said, my bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? So not only are there people on the outside questioning me about my faith, from the inside out, I'm starting to question my faith. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Three, downcast. Why so disturbed within me? Ah, but here's the turn again. Put your hope in God, for I, I will yet praise him, my Savior in God. Which means don't let hope uh, delay. Don't let hope try to show up after happiness. Don't let hope try to show up after everything's okay. Hope actually needs to be the precursor of things being okay again there being peace. Hope has to arrive when it feels like there's no hope. That's how it works in the Christian life. When it seems like there's no hope, 
Here come hope. There's a storm. Where's the hope? Oh, there's Jesus. Just told the storm to shh. Hope is the precursor to things feeling settled again. Things, things getting right again. You got to find your hope first. When you feel alone, receive God's presence. God does great work in tough places. Deserts, caves, prisons, crosses. <laughs> Man, I don't wish for no desert for me or you. I don't want it. I'd rather be where it's green and stuff is, you know, it's just plush and things is growing. Look how pretty it is. Out of a desert, I ain't never thought of a vacation destination and said, let's look up the deserts. <laughs> you know, some people like going in caves and stuff. Not me. <laughs> no, mm -mm. no, no. At, at, at prison, I'm not even talking about that one. <laughs> what, what I'm trying to say is people don't wish for circumstances that they find themselves in. People in prison didn't come out of their mother's womb and say, I've got a dream one day. <laughs> people, people that find themselves in a valley, people that find themselves in depression, people that find themselves in caves and tough places didn't pray for it, but yet it happened. And that's when you can feel God's presence. And that's what I love about the Bible. If you really dive deep into the word of God, if you really dive deep into it, you'll find that there's no place, there's no circumstance where you can't experience the presence of God. Romans is right. Neither height nor depth, neither prince of power, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. So as I close, sisters and brothers, when you've tried everything else, rest in him. I told you that a lot of Psalm is written by David. Not all of it, but a significant chunk of it. And I want to close with Psalm 62. This is written by David. David says these words in Psalm 62, verses 5 through 8. Yes, my soul finds rest in God. My hope comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. This is a song. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. David is a complicated guy. I mean, he killed a giant Goliath, but then he's scared of King Saul. He takes on giants, but he hides in a cave. He's a man after God's own heart, and he has multiple wives and concubines. So he is, I, I, sometimes I get confused about David, because we say dance like David. I'm like, which dance? I mean, it's just like worship like David. God, David was anointed. David was godly. And then I read a number of things about David that are complicated. He took another guy's wife, had that guy murdered. This is the guy we're supposed to dance like. This is the guy we're supposed to worship like. This, this, this is the anointed one. This, this is the one that, that, that lets us know that Jesus is in the lineage of a king, David. W w why David? But yet again, when I look at David, I, 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 I can see the journey of godliness. Uh, all of us have baggage in here. All of us have issues. None of us want a documentary of our thought life put on the screen. <laughs> but I know this. David ends well. I don't want all of the journey of David. But when David comes to the end of his life, hope rises. He says to his son Solomon, you will build the temple that I couldn't. Obey God. Follow God's commandments. There has been bloodshed in the family of David. There has been brokenness and sin in the family of David. And yet at the end of his life, he is full of hope for his son Solomon. May we all end well like that. With hope in our hearts, let hope rise. This is my real close. Um, I told you that I was... Uh, I, that, that I went on a trip to Kenya, and um, 
uh, while I was in Kenya back in 2010, um, I, I, I went on a safari. And this, this is awesome. I, I went on a safari, and, and of course, I saw animals that I was just, man, I was so excited to see. I saw giraffes, like I, I saw uh, the elephants, I saw zebras, lions. Oh my gosh. But for some reason, the safari guide made a big deal out of the Impala. And I was like, why are we talking about the Impala? Let's see another lion. Let's see another giraffe. He's like, I've got to tell you about the Impala. I thought the Impala was a car. I didn't even know. <laughs> I didn't even know. And so he's, he's saying the Impala, when he's standing on all fours, he has the ability to jump 13 feet high in the air. So if a lion comes and tries to attack an impala, it's its God-given ability. It can rise 13 feet high in the air. When the impala is running, when it's on the move, it can jump 13 feet high and 30 feet out. It's its God-given ability. I was like, wow, that's amazing. So when I got back home uh, a few months later, my family, we were at the San Francisco Zoo. And while we were at the San Francisco Zoo, I saw some impalas. But these impalas, uh, even though there was taller fencing, they were initially contained by a three-foot wall. And they wouldn't jump over it. And I was concerned. So I was talking to them. I was like, look, I just saw your cousins in <laughs> Kenya. And I don't know if you know this, but you don't have to put up with these conditions. You can jump 13 feet high and 30 feet out. I just kept talking to them. I was like, Impala lives matter. But they, <laughs> they wouldn't listen to me. So I was getting frustrated about this. So I went to the, somebody on staff at the zoo, and I was like, what is going on with these Impalas? I, I heard they can jump 13 feet high, 30 feet out, but they won't even jump over a three-foot wall. She, and she said to me, she says, you're, you're correct. She said, uh, when the Impalas are babies, we build this three-foot wall. They have the ability to jump over it as babies. She said, but what we found out is that Impalas won't jump if they can't see where they're going to land. So they have to see first where they're going to land, and then they jump. So they look for their landing point, then they jump. If their landing point, if their destination is blocked, if there is a barrier put up between where they are and where they want to go, they won't jump. She said, this probably won't make sense to you, sir, but Impalas don't have faith. <laughs> I said, thank you very much for the sermon. I don't know where you're going to land. I don't even know where I'm going to land. But we jump anyway. There is an enemy trying to put a series of three-foot walls in front of your marriage, in front of your manhood, in front of your womanhood, in front of your singleness, in front of your mindset, in front of your emotions. And, and the enemy doesn't want you to know that you have this ability to rise with your hope in God. You have the ability to jump 13 feet high and 30 feet out. It's your God-given ability through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You have been called to rise. The enemy, this sinful world, is going to keep putting one three-foot wall. As soon as you find the hope to jump over one, you're going to find another. Just become a hurdler. That's what you're going to have to do. In this race, you are going to have to learn time after time after time to rise. So jump. Even Van Halen said you might as well jump. So you might as well jump. Jump over depression. Jump over stubbornness. Jump over pride. Jump over brokenness. Jump over abuse. Jump over failure. Jump over circumstances. You have the ability. Put your hope in God. Your hope is built on nothing less than Jesus. Jesus Christ, his righteousness. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Turn your sinking sand into a springboard. 
and jump. You don't have to stay where you are. Put your hope in God.